Low back hair has a name. Lo Lobe back hair. Oh, the uh, uh, um, cerebellum. 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 My cerebellum doesn't it? wink yet. It's not awake, so are you no. tripping when yeah, you walk? I'm a, I'm a yeah. little unstable. You should do my gait check. Oh. Yeah, I did shave. First shave on Mars. You look like a little baby now. Baby? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, who's the guy um, on uh, the Jamaican sled, bobsled team? Which Remember guy? that old, old movie? It was, mm -hmm. um, and the Jamaican sled, bobsled team. Yeah. Come on. And then the guy's like, in the oh, mirror. Oh, yeah. Come on, who's the, who's the name of that guy? I don't know the name of oh, that guy. Oh, come on. That was like five when that movie came out. Um, we're not that old. Are no, we? that's not true. Yeah, probably Please like eight. That. Oh, big yeah, difference. I was okay. Young. <laughs> big difference. It's your last day on Mars. I man. remember John Candy was the like coach though. Not John Candy. What was his name? Who was the white guy? Uncle that I'm Buck. Talking about? Uncle Buck is who I'm talking about. But what's that, his name? We're John gonna go Candy. with him. Un was that his name? <laughs> I think so. Uncle Buck. Uncle Buck. Anyway, you remind me of Uncle Buck when he's fresh shaved. Oh yeah. <gasps> <laughs> Okay, so your last day. Sorry. Hey guys, how are you? Um, welcome to our podcast. <laughs> um, it's your last day on Mars. It is sad. That's okay. We have an exciting podcast though. We do. Because we um, learned a lot. We wanted to first start out by some talking about some medical stuff instead of our normal flagellants and disgustingness. Yeah. Well, you already brought it up. So actually, I feel pretty fresh right now. I took a shower. You smell good. This suit is a little bit. Uh, I smell okay. Underneath, I actually smell better than over. Yeah. That's the first. That that's is. the first. I Don't smell okay. Oh. I think my nose is kind of clogged. We're just going to say I smell good. I did an astronaut shower last night, though. Actually, I've been sleeping. I was worried that I wouldn't sleep well being all sticky and sweaty and stuff like that. So, did you do a baby wash? I baby? did a baby wipe. Yeah. So, an shower. astronaut shower is a baby wipe shower. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you took a, a real earth shower this morning. I did, yeah, real earth shower. In a bucket. I don't know how earthy that is. It's yeah. still in a bucket. Yeah, it's in a bucket. But it's in a bucket. It works pretty well, actually. Yeah. You know, it's cold. It I, cold. when I heard, when I was in my sleeping quarters and I heard mm -hmm. the sh the little psh, psh, psh shower, I was like, <laughs> no way is he taking a shower. I'm like, I am I have my undergarments on mm -hmm. right now because I am still so cold. Uh, well, I can take this off. but Because I might have to... Well, I have to go ask the captain for a ride. So I'm, I'm jump seating home, which means I'm basically catching a ride on a different airline. And I got to ask the captain, and I might have to sit up front with the other guy. So I wanted oh. to not smell like a. Uh, it's probably a hobo. good first, first step. Good first step. Good first step. Uh, but, good uh, first step. Other than that. You know, so, last day, well, what are you going to miss the most? Um, Probably the simplicity yeah simplicity i know as soon as i turn my phone off airplane mode it's just gonna be yeah oh man i know i got hundreds of emails to check and i'm gonna take a little we're gonna break sim after he leaves and uh -huh. there's some cool mountains behind us i'm gonna go for a long hike yeah. before i turn my phone on yeah and then i'll turn my phone on <laughs> i guess the views the camaraderie mm -hmm. I was gonna say that's that's yeah. you should miss that. It's me, of course. <laughs> Duh. Of course. No, that's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, it's a different life up here, that's for sure. Yeah. So. I don't know. I learned a lot. So let's let's uh, share with our guests some of the medical stuff we learned because I think a lot of this is just us um, joking, <laughs> which I'm sure this is gonna turn into a joke yeah. fest. But <laughs> we, I promise, we are serious yeah. at some point. Yeah. Um, so uh, here, it's really cool. We have some um, some medical devices, and I wanted to show what we bring out on Amoeba, which is the medical EVA. Um, so first and foremost is the goodie bag. So when if um, someone's glucose is running low, or they get you know they're getting lightheaded or anything like that, we have an emergency kit. And in our emergency kit, we have a tootsie roll. <laughs> uh, what's this? It's a um, uh, it's like a and here you can have one eat my medical bag or breaking mm. sim soon so um, we have a uh, Capri Sun um, we have this was our marker at one point um, yeah. yeah for our location we have a Tootsie Roll mm -hmm. a Tootsie Roll we have some salt a piece of gum mm -hmm. we have some gum I actually I'm not my so we are in the desert which means 
It's cold at night. It's and really cold at night. It's hot during the day. So when we go out on our EVAs, it can get pretty hot. It, it gets know. really hot, yeah. In fact, Al dropped out one time because yeah. of the, the heat. And yeah. uh, and we had to use our medical bag. Well, we did have to use our medical so, bag. So um, a hint is if uh, also uh, if you get like little sugar cubes when you're out, um, if someone can't, you know, if they're so far gone that they can't chew, just stick it in their mouth and let it melt and their glucose uh, levels will rise back to normal. Um, but good, good sugary drinks, bring those. You want something that's going to shock them back into a normal level. So mm -hmm. that's our medical um, goodie bag. And then we have out in the field, we don't bring all of this out in the field here, but some like this, uh, we always bring an extra string, especially for like a tourniquet. Hey, you want to show a tourniquet? Sure. I have a huge gash right here. Right here. Right. If I have a gash um, here, where would you t tie the tourniquet? So if she has a massive hemorrhage, which means she's bleeding profusely uh, in a way that might actually kill her because she's losing blood so fast, yeah. we want to find where she's bleeding from and go two to three inches above that. It's important to not go too far above or too far below because you don't want to do unnecessary damage. A tourniquet is a last resort method to cut off the bleeding to prevent death. Uh, when you apply a tourniquet, there's there's a likely chance that uh, you will destroy all the, the tissue below the tourniquet, which means she may have to lose her leg after using a tourniquet. Um, so it's important that you do, don't do unnecessary damage. So if she has a cut here, I don't want to put a tourniquet up here because she would have to lose probably, you know, a good foot of leg that you don't necessarily. And, and all of this is really healthy tissue, right? So when you mm -hmm. when you put a tourniquet on here, what you're doing is you are taking everything below and you are starving it of oxygen, mm -hmm. right? So you're taking the blood, you're you're cutting off that that um, supply and and blood it has the oxygen as well. So anything below, you're basically just killing. So. The first step of a tourniquet is that you tie, um, the first part would be like, just like you do a shoelace, right? So you start your shoelace, don't tie a double knot in it, just the start of a shoelace. Then you uh, find a stick, I'm gonna use a marker right now, but if you're out in the field, just find a stick of some kind, right? It's a black marker, it matches your shoe. It's a black marker. And then you're gonna do <laughs> another, just like you would a shoelace, just like that, bam. And then you are gonna take the marker, go ahead, you can show them, and you're gonna spin it around, and that is gonna tighten it, and I can feel it tightening. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> you can do it really tight, ouch. So, but the thing is, watch what happens. If he lets the marker go, it's just gonna unravel, right? So now we have to tie, with with our extra string, we have to tie um, this, we have to tie a portion of it that will lock it off. So now when he lets it go, it's in place, right? Um, please don't tie a double knot in it because when rescue comes, this is just a, it's not a permanent solution, right? They, they don't want to be like, oh my gosh, it's a double knot, where do I go? So do like a loop of some kind, like a shoelace, so then you can just easily get it off and the emergency people can remove it as quick as possible and then put on whatever permanent solution that they need. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, we also carry splints with us. Um, you can describe what a splint is if you'd like. A splint would, I mean, a splint is anything that can keep the the injured appendage, leg, arm immobilized. So two pieces of wood uh, are common for a splint. You put it on both sides mm -hmm. just to keep it in place. This is important if you have a fracture, mm -hmm. such as a bone break or anything that you want to keep from doing more damage as you're moving that person around. Mm -hmm. So we did a night um, EVA, so it's um, a NEVA, and it's a medical um, EVA it, at night basically. So we found our injured astronaut uh, stuck in a Martian tree <laughs> and <laughs> he he was just kind of lodged in there and so we had to we you know we first we went up checked our area and wanted to see if he was conscious um, he wasn't so we looked around we made sure it was safe and then we had to get him out of the tree to treat him so I stabilized his neck you grabbed his torso we flipped him, got him on the ground, started CPR because he was unresponsive. Why did you stabilize his neck, Dr. Watt? Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> um, neck is very important because if anything happens between the C, I think it's a C3 and 4 or 4 and 5, um, there is a crossover what happens. And if you at all injure those two vertebrae, then you become um, paralyzed. 
So he want to make sure that the neck stays as still as possible during any maneuver that you do. You want to immobilize that area so you do not have any damage and you, you prevent um, mm -hmm. paralysis from occurring. Yeah. So that was super, super important. And you want the stronger person to be on the trunk uh, area and the weaker person to be at the head. And now we all know from my body map. I am the, the strongest, <laughs> but I wanted you to feel like manly okay. and all, so you got the trunk. Right, exactly. What's a trunk? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot you did ask that. Um, okay, so you have the head and you have the trunk. Um, the trunk is basically from from the shoulder to your your waistline. That's your trunk area, and that is the heaviest part of your body. And then you have mm -hmm. your appendages. So you have your uh, extremities. You have your upper extremities, which is your arms, and you have your lower extremities, which is your feet. But the trunk is definitely the heaviest part of of your body. So you want the strongest person to take that part. Um, and as Monkey was saying, so you have the crossover mm -hmm. of uh, the. Not only yes, the, uh, the nervous system, uh, but you also have the arteries and mm -hmm. veins crossing over in the neck as well. So when it's very important that you immobilize the head because you don't know if there's damage or no. there's, a, there's a break there. And if there is a break there and you start moving that person around and there's, there's a sharp piece of that bone okay. that is broken in the neck and it slices through, mm -hmm. uh, well, it could be immediate death or... You know, you could uh, permanently... It could be immediate death. Yeah. Or paralysis, yeah. Or paralysis. Um, and another interesting thing is because of that crossover, what, the, what that does is if I can't move my right arm, that means my left side of my brain has damage or vice versa. So whatever part, if I have damage on, it's going to be the opposite side of your, your brain. So another way to look at brain damage is to use this little flashlight thing and you're going to do, hey, why don't I show you? So you look at your patient and you say, um, please stare right um, into my eyes. Mm -hmm. Don't move your eyeballs or anything like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shine a light and I'm going to take this light and I'm going to move it in front of your eye. Please don't move your eye though, okay? So, <laughs> and he moves his eye. All right, I'm going to shine the light. I'm ready? Get instructions. And No, you're not. And again and out. Very good. Do He's it? doing like weird things with his eyeballs. <laughs> so what this does, what you do is so I'm going to shine the light at you guys and I'm going to go in and out. And as it crosses over the eye, what you're going to see is the black part of your eye, your pupil, is going to decrease. And then when the light goes away, it's going to increase. So what that's doing is it's contracting. So in other words, it's going small and big again. And it does that if it is if it's working, you don't have a brain injury, your eyes are going to contract. It's going to react to the light. When you shine a bright light in your eye, your eye doesn't want all that light. It's going to say, go away. So it closes. So it doesn't get all that in there, right? All the, all the light. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, so if your eye doesn't do that, that means that you have brain damage in that eye. Um, and you want to do both sides. If both sides aren't working, you got some serious problems. If one side isn't working, then you have brain damage on that side. Mm-hmm. So that's a good that's a good tool. We used this last night actually. We did, we yeah, did. I was like I hold held open our astronaut's yeah, eye and I was like, yeah. dude, you there? So I e didn't say that. <laughs> I was I was professional. Igor, Igor. I go, Igor, Igor, what happened there? To Igor. I think you screwed up that mission last night. No, we didn't screw it yeah, up. We not properly pre flighting your spacesuit. <laughs> no, my oh oh so okay. So we we have scenarios are just brought into us and during our, our Neva, AI said that I uh, had a breach in my air suit. So once we were, we had Eeyore, Igor, Igor, on the floor, we were doing CPR and stuff, and um, this is like so deep for we a podcast, I but know. whatever, <laughs> all right, we're gonna get into it a little bit. I don't, I'm nervous about the comments, um, but, uh, so, <clears throat> we're doing CPR and everything, and then AI's like, um, monkey, you have a breach in your pack. And I said, okay. He goes, you have three minutes. And I said, all right. So we did as much as we could within about two and a half-ish minutes to save Igor. And he was definitely making noises of, I'm not going to make it. Um, and we had to make a decision. Do, you, do a healthy person and the commander die? Or do we say, hey, buddy, you know, we're going to say a prayer for you. You're out. Um, which sounds cold-hearted. Cold I'm not... I don't want to get too much into it on a podcast, but it is it is a very difficult situation to make during the field. And I thought about this for a while in this mission. Mm -hmm. 
because originally people come in and they're like, I'm, I'm going to wait till the last minute we'll all die together. But then you have to think about, okay, well, if you all die, that's three crew members that are no longer with the entire crew. That means that you are losing specialties. You have your biomedical engineer here, you have commander here, and now you are lost those two. So now your responsibilities of the other crew members go up. Um, the danger goes up for them for survival. Um, so you have to make a decision. And, and my point of view, with the very little experience that I have, so please it could change. Try not to judge me too harshly. Um, <laughs> As adults, we sign waivers, we understand the dangers that we're getting into, and we have to realize that death is, is a real possibility, and if it was me laying there, I know I signed up for this. I know that if I am in immediate danger and I'm not going to make it, you got to leave me and save yourself because you guys are the healthy ones mm -hmm. and you can help the crew's and survival. He went into cardiac arrest he twice. He Two, had a massive twice. hemorrhage. He had a massive hemorrhage on his leg. He was bleeding out. Mm -hmm. His suit was compromised. Yeah. He was, there was... From landing in the tree. I mean, it was no just... saving him at that point. It wasn't. So what we did was we tried for the two minutes. We made a decision. We, when he was taking off his pack to give to me to finish breathing, we said a prayer, we held him, and we just kind of let go. Um, we had 30 seconds to run back to the HAB. We did take his body with us. I threw that over my shoulder. We ran to the HAB. Um, by the time we got back to airlock, I was completely out. 30 seconds had gone. Um, then I went into cardiac arrest. I, couldn't, I, mm -hmm. I lost all oxygen, so I collapsed in the airlock. Um, so what... Orca did was took his off, kind of like in scuba diving where you have your second, except for we don't have a second. So well, you're doing CPR. He would breathe. You did CPR for a little bit first. Probably like uh, 90 compressions. Yeah, you did. And then I said, well, she needs oxygen. If yeah. there's no use in continuing doing CPR yeah. if you don't have oxygen. Yeah. So. so after 90 compressions, you took off. We had our, our tubes here that went to our air pack. And he would basically just share with me. We'd take a few breaths. I would hold. And I came back into consciousness. And I was like, thanks for sharing. I'll take a breath. He took some breaths. I took some breaths. And this whole time we were in the airlock yeah. waiting for decompression, the, for pressurization. So they were repressurizing the airlock so we could enter the hab. And that takes about three minutes. It's the longest three minutes yeah, of your life. Yeah, that was a long three minutes. And then Habcom and Orca helped me back into Habcom area. And... Then you guys just basically performed medical treatment, made sure I was okay. Um, I actually, I had oxygen. We were in HAPCOM mm -hmm. and all that. And then um, and then I was good. Yeah. So thanks for saving my life. Yeah. We did bring the corpse back and we did a proper mm -hmm. ceremony and everything. It was an interesting scenario that we played out last night. And it kind of reminded me of the movie The Martian. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we watched a little bit of that yeah. on, the, on our movie night here yeah. on Mars. But... Uh, in the scenario, they left Mark Watney behind. The commander made the decision to launch. Um, and if you if you play it back, you know as they're going through space and they find out he's alive, the commander has a really hard time, you know, dealing with that. But if you think about it, in that movie and in that situation, their MAV, their Mars Ascent vehicle, was about to tip over. They would all died. They would all died because they didn't have enough food to survive that long. So. She made the right decision. She made the right call in that movie, and it's that's called you know triage. Save the most, uh, do the most amount of good uh, while and, minimizing loss. And, and you have I, it's to do that. it's hard, guys. It's so hard. I know it's make believe at the end of the day, mm -hmm. um, and who knows what you would make in in the moment. And we're not taking it lightly. I've lost a lot of people in my life, and I'm sure you've dealt with death too. It's not something that it's something. We're not joking about it. Um, we try to make light of it to get through it, but it is it is a very difficult situation when you're in the moment. So if you're looking to do things like this, it is something to ask yourself privately before you get into the situation. Could you do it? Mm -hmm. Could you live with yourself after you did it? Um, and I know some people are quick to make the judgment, but you really have to think about it. Um, mm -hmm. It's different in the situation. Can we move on? Yeah, absolutely. That would be great because this is going. <laughs> this is getting serious real Sad. quick. <laughs> uh, um, okay. Anyway, so we also learned um, how to do some. So, so this is actually really cool. So everyone knows what this is. You see this at a doctor's office all the time. But this one, I've never seen. Here, you want to take half? Stethoscope. This is a training one. So 
I'm the expert. You can oh, you can you can okay. put yours on. I'm just kidding. So, um, so what you can do, and I'm getting one of these for my kids, by the way. So you have one part here, and then you the diaphragm. You only have one, and then you have mm -hmm. the two ears. So we're both hearing the same thing. Um, so I uh, the teacher. So say he's the teacher, and I'm the student. I can I can search for his heart rate in the certain mm -hmm. positions that are here, and I can tell him what I'm hearing. And then he can either confirm or say, I'm a bozo. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can also do, so you do the heart. So your four heart spots. is, yep. We're looking for all uh, four chambers of the heart. And so you see got... that he's touching his right pec area. It, your heart is not in the center. Think about the um, um, Pledge of Allegiance. You touch this part of it. You're not like in the middle, right? So your heart is actually shifted to the right side. Right. Yep, just like that. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Now everyone's a, a little different if you actually do a scan, but we'll say the average is that, right? So, and then well, if you have diseases really big, and stuff, really, is it well, really big? Are you, yeah. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the Grinch after? Yes. After yes. it like grew like yeah. 10 sizes? Okay, whatever. Hush. <laughs> so I'm going to put the diaphragm in the locations and I'm going to wait to hear a beat. Now, if he's healthy, it should go bum, 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 bum. Bum, bum. If you have um, any kind of arrhythmia or anything, you'll hear a different pattern, and that's a huge cue to say, hey, buddy, something's not right. So this is a very easy um, and cheap device that you can keep in your house if you, you know, just to keep healthy and, and check your family members. And then you can also listen to the lungs. Um, the lungs you're going to listen in the, the posterior side, which is your back side. Um, and what you want to listen to is you want to hear um, very clear breathing. You can YouTube different types like uh, bronchitis, COVID lungs, smoker's lungs. They all sound different. Uh, it's very interesting, but you'll hear crackles like in bronchitis. Um, COVID was super interesting. Yeah. It was the weirdest like alien sounding strangeness yeah. I've ever heard so I would encourage um, you to just google different different sounds but you're gonna put them here you can show them on my back there's eight separate locations yeah. on the back you want to listen to uh, to hear the lungs you're gonna go in a pattern and have your person breathe kind of like a six-pack and as yeah. you're listening you tell them to take all right take a large breath in and out in and out in and out in and out and then these two as well am i alive you're alive i have a, I a stuffy how. nose i don't yeah, i don't either a bunch of gremlins in there i do i <laughs> We're all catching a little bit. We, of the, with the Mars the, funk. Yeah, with the with the <clears> severe <throat> um, weather changing, um, we had a stand, sandstorm yesterday. Um, the temperature differences during the day and at night is so severe. And I'm from Florida, totally not used to any change at all, and barely a season. Mm -hmm. um, so that has been interesting, yeah, to say the least. Um, right. My nose is full. I, I'm, I'm sure you can hear the sound of my my voice. Um, so there's a few other tools. I've actually never seen these things before. So these two, I don't know if you can see them very tuning well. Tuning forks. Yep, these are tuning forks for hearing. So if you want to see if someone has um, hearing damage, this one is a high pitch, this one's more of a low pitch, and you basically hit it and you hear. And it's really cool, it hears, I wonder if the camera pouch can I'm pick sure this up. I can hear this. So let's hope you can hear that. I'm not sure, but it's really cool. Um, so those are those are the, um, tuning devices. Um, so and then I think that's all we have. We'll have to do another video on uh -huh. suturing, but we'll do that later. But yeah, so that's our our um, real quick medical medical. Um, oh, and then you can also do peripheral vision, and you can mm -hmm. also do um, uh, muscle testing. So like if you're you're even. Um, that's for like stroke victims and mm -hmm. things like when you're going through therapy. Mm -hmm. So if you push on me and say like he's off and he's like, like really hard on one side, but nothing on another side, that's a cue to me that there might be some issues there. You might've uh, experienced a stroke of some kind. Brain damage yep. or, uh, um, muscle atrophy. 
Yeah, muscle atrophy is huge. Muscle atrophy and microgravity environment is mm -hmm. huge. Um, so that's a way to tell are they healing um, bilaterally or not. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's all of our medical. Have you atrophied while being on Mars at all? So Mars is what one one third of uh, yeah, I think so. Earth's gravity or I um, go from working out six days a week to nothing, and I feel like I'm a little twig. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I I honestly feel like I've atrophied. Now, if this was really Mars um, on the ISS, we see atrophy within two weeks. Mm -hmm. So um, being on Mars you would see it in a in a pretty short time frame so mm -hmm. we this is soul eight um i think my body would definitely be feeling mm -hmm. some atrophy um our bodies are incredible mm -hmm. we adapt to any environment and when we're in the environment the it's important to adapt the only time that it becomes a problem is when we come back to an uh, environment that has full gravity that's where it becomes really dangerous. So when we're on the ISS, our bodies are like, I don't have to hold you up anymore. Mm -hmm. So our legs become weak. Um, it says our hearts say, well, I don't have to pump the fluid all the way back to your feet anymore because now it's even. So it's like, I'm going to become smaller. I don't have mm -hmm. to be that strong. Um, there's so many things that our body's adapting to, which is great. That's what we need in that environment. It becomes problematic when we come back to Earth and we land and now all of a sudden we say, um, hey body, within one second I'm going to stand up and you now have to hold me. Mm -hmm. It takes a little bit longer to adapt, Actually, right? Yeah, many of the astronauts, once they land and get out of the, the landing capsule or space vehicle, will pass out yep. uh, if they've, they've been in space for a long time because all of a sudden the gravity pulls all of this blood into their legs, yep. which hasn't been happening for however long that they were in space which drains it from their brain and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they pass yeah. out uh, so in a lot of if you pay attention to watching astronauts return a lot of them will be sitting down that will have a couch mm -hmm. so as soon as they they get them out they put them on this couch and they actually have to go through some uh, physical therapy and uh, getting back into health and um, building up their muscle and bone density as well mm -hmm. so and there's some things that they can recover, like muscles. They're going to they're going to get that back. Bone density, not so much, um, and a lot of the eyes. So when fluid is it, so in microgravity, uh, it's an upward shift because when you are on Earth, I'll try to put an uh, image up here. When you're on Earth, gravity is pulling most of your fluid down towards your feet. So if you did like a color shading of your entire body, like say you have a stick figure here, on the on the bottom you're gonna have really dark shades because you have a lot of fluid there, and then it's gonna become lighter shade, lighter shade, lighter shade, lighter shade. It, on ISS, the shading is completely even. So now that it's even, the heart feels more pressure around it, and the in on the back of the eyes you're gonna feel more pressure. So you, it's called a bug-eyed syndrome because now the pressure behind the eyes. It's something that we're not used to, so it's going to press them out a little bit, and it's going to distort your retina. Mm -hmm. So now, when you come back to Earth, that distortion, the shape change, some of the astronauts, they the shape is permanent. Um, so they'll either need glasses, or some go blind. Um, so some things you can recover from, and some things you can't. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And there's biosensors in the body as well that are... Mm -hmm. that, that are sensing things like pressure. Uh, so one of the things that's happening as you push, you're getting more, so we call it the fluid upshift. Mm -hmm. So as uh, in microgravity, more of the, the fluid enters the head. So if you watch these videos of astronauts on the ISS, some of them, they, they look flushed, a little bit puffy in the face. It's because they have more blood in their head mm -hmm. and uh, these biosensors are actually saying, there's too much pressure. There's too much blood pressure in my head, which kind of changes your whole physiology. And then, like you were saying, the blood stops, the the heart stops working as hard, which leads to heart muscle atrophy. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's there's a lot of uh, issues with humans living in space, which is what a lot of the the medical research is focused on right now. So there's two things that I want to add to that. It's a really good point. So you have uh, skeletal muscle and you have um, and you have cardiac muscle so your skeletal and cardiac muscle you have cells within it and the cells what they can do is expand and shrink and expand and shrink which is vastly different than a fat cell a fat cell can expand separate expand separate expand separate that's why um, obesity is um, 
So how do I explain that? So that's why when you're expanding, you you can become your fat cells can be can keep going and going and going. They can multiply. But your your muscles they can't just keep going and going and going and going and going and going, mm -hmm. going, and going right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So the cells just get bigger and shrink. So when you're on the ISS, those cells are going to shrink. But then when you come back to Earth, they can refill, right? Mm -hmm. um, so so that was one thing. And then the second thing is on the ISS, we do have machines to try to combat this. Um, they're not 100% effective yet. But they are, they do have some effect, okay? So the first one is the the um, really stiff pants that they put on, and it's basically a vacuum. And what it does is it pulls the fluids away from your eyes and your heart. Uh, it acts as basically a lower body negative pressure um, pants, and it just acts as a vacuum. It just pulls it down so it gives your eyes a break, and it makes your heart work a little bit more so it, it makes those cells fill mm -hmm. up more so that's one thing that they have and then they have three different types of exercise devices they have an a the a red is that the advanced resistive exercise device perfect yep Got it. um perfect <laughs> perfect and you can do so much stuff on that that's for your muscles um so that's all the resistance exercises it's also you can do. bone density as well combat bone loss because it the um it provides that those impact loads which are important for telling the body not to break down all of your bone density yeah, yeah, it does that a little bit. So there's another machine, the um, the treadmill, mm -hmm. that is going to act more towards the bone density because when you run, it's two times your body weight. Mm -hmm. So that's why if you have bad knees on earth, they're like, don't run on concrete. It's because the forces in your knees and on your bones is twice the times your body weight. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a large impact, but you need that for bone density. You need that impact. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a treadmill Mm -hmm. really specifically to get that um, impact for the bone loss. So you mm -hmm. have the A-RED, which of course helps with bones for mm -hmm. sure, but more focused on the, the muscle atrophy and combating that. Treadmill, mm -hmm. more focused on the bone density and com uh, combating that. And we have, it, you're, some of you might be thinking, well, that's only the legs, what about everything else? Well, it's been seen and results in all the data that we collected the bone loss and the muscle atrophy really occurs from the L3 down, so your lower back down. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it. We're not on earth walking on our hands. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know, so our arms don't really do as much as we do with our legs. Our mm -hmm. legs are holding us up all the time. Well, now you take that away and you're floating, you don't need it. So mm -hmm. we see drastic changes um, in, in the lower part of the body. So all these machines are really focused on targeting the lower part. The A red, you can do upper arm workouts mm -hmm. in though, so so that helps with the muscle atrophy. But the bone density, we don't really focus right now on the upper body. And then they have the last machine, which is the um, the bicycle thing that they do, and that is for your cardiovascular system, just mm -hmm. to make sure that you're staying healthy um, and you're getting that cardio work in. So we do have some. They're not perfect. Mm -hmm. They're not perfect. We still have a long way to go. So those listening, get on it. Mm -hmm. Go go make something. Go research something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so we have four four things I believe up there. I'm probably missing something, but those are for like the, the more of the exercise stuff. We do have um, supplements and things that they take calcium and all that stuff, but just focusing on the exercise machines. That's what they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So bone bone set, bone density loss is internal to the bones. You have two different types of cells: the mm -hmm. osteoclasts mm -hmm. and osteoblasts. So when when you take the body out of a gravity environment, all of a sudden the brain, those biosensors are telling you, okay, well, um, the the body isn't uh, taking these impact loads anymore. So uh, the osteoclasts still work because th those are the cat. The, they're breaking down bone tissue to be replaced by the osteoblasts but these biosensors are telling the brain we don't have these impact loads anymore so it tells the osteoblasts to stop building new bone tissue so yeah. you still have this process where it's breaking down old bone tissue but it's not rebuilding and which is why you come back and you have kind of if you if you if you cut a an astronaut's bone in half and the you look section if you look at the cross section, cross section? Okay. it would kind of look spongy internal so we're, we're meant to have these dense bones um unlike like bird bones uh that are more hollow and spongy on the inside but uh as you break down the bone uh tissue or the bone mass it would uh 
become more spongy on the inside, which is very dangerous, and we're, we're worried about that with missions to Mars, because if you're in space for three months and you have this, this bone, uh, bone loss, and you have to immediately you enter Mars's gravity, and you do entry, descent, and landing, there's a high potential that you get out of the spacecraft or on the high G loads uh, that you'd experience entering the gravity of Mars, you might have a break, and that would be catastrophic for an astronaut on Mars. I have a student looking at it right now. He's doing uh, a model of a bone, and he's changing the properties within it, and it's making it weaker in certain parts, and then he'll do a crash landing and see where the break happens and where the most spongiest part is mm -hmm. of how it um, um, the bone loss occurs, like the rate of it and where it occurs, if it's like in the shaft or if it's in the endpoints and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's extremely interesting, yeah. yeah. So it'll be, mm -hmm. it, it'll be nice to see what the results are, so it'll help. Um, on the landing parts. Yeah. But yeah. It'd be interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So other than that, what are the other medical issues with being in space? Radiation, CO2. Radiation. Carbon. Radiation and, and CO2 is huge. Carbon dioxide, that's an interesting topic. I, I talk about this a lot in flight training. Uh, I also, you know, uh, I'm a flight instructor on the side, but uh, we talk about carbon dioxide and it's interesting what happens to the body when you starve yourself of oxygen versus when you starve yourself of carbon dioxide or you have too much carbon dioxide. The body is actually much more sensitive to carbon dioxide than it is to oxygen. At least we have more sensors to regulate that. Because if you take away oxygen, actually what happens to the body, we'll just, we just get euphoric so we feel good, we feel like high, and then you die. When, when you actually That's how I want to die. <laughs> That would be the way I want to die. But the body is much more sensitive to carbon dioxide. So if we have too much carbon dioxide, immediately our body's going to start telling us something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Because you can die at a very low low percentage of carbon dioxide in Which the Which is the one where we did, because I did the zero, um, the flight training, mm -hmm. where we did, um, it's called the vomit comet or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we had to do training, so we go into a chamber and we, we take off our masks. And they hand us like these pictures and, and tasks to do. And I remember one of them was an elephant. Elephant obviously has a trunk and then four legs, right? And then a little tail. Mm -hmm. Okay, but as I was going through it, the elephant had six legs and then eight legs. And it, it started changing. And I was like, what is going on? Um, what was I oh. being starved of? Uh, the uh, CO2 or the oxygen? Oxygen. Oh, so I just felt good and I was like, ah, yeah, that elephant yeah. has some legs. Yeah, that's called a hypoxia. That's the, the training yeah. that we went through. It was uh -huh. a while ago. I don't I don't remember mm -hmm. the exact stuff, but we had that was one of them, the test. Yeah. I remember the elephant. Yeah, that's fun. And that was cool. I, I just remember getting giggly. Yeah, that's all, you just got giggly. giggly? I didn't get giggly. I just yeah. saw things. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. I need a redo. One of the main issues, and you'll hear astronauts complaining about this a lot from after their trips to the ISS, the carbon dioxide removal assembly, or the SIDRA, C-D-R-A, uh, on the ISS is meant... So the, the ISS is a system that's almost completely closed, but they still need to bring uh, supplies to it. So it's not a closed loop system, but they do, they scrub the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, so that people don't have carbon dioxide. How do they scrub it? They have, they pass it over chemicals, it's kind of like a... Um, they have, I forget, forget, they used to use these chemical packs in the older spacecraft, but they have a, a different process where they pass it over these chemicals and it, it scrubs the oh, okay. carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, but it is, uh, you'll, you'll immediately notice, and they, they say when, when they have, so the crews come up, especially in the shuttle era, they would have, you know, five or six more people on the ISS for a couple of days while they were on their missions and they would immediately notice the more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because they would all start getting headaches and oh. and uh, all that so stuff. that not the giggly one not the, the giggly, giggly one. No. Oh, that so carbon dioxide isn't fun your body does not like uh, the incorrect amount of carbon dioxide. Your flight instructor, do you have to put mm -hmm. your students through that training? Is it kind of the same training in flight that it is on the ISS for um, astronauts? Not necessarily. Uh, what are the differences? Don't, and you don't have to go through hypoxia training to really? become a pilot, but uh, you you are you are recommended to do it. Um, we do have a normal barrack chamber yeah. uh, where I studied and where I taught. Um, at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, but uh, 
a normal barrack changer, chamber means it doesn't change the pressure. We just change the amount of oxygen in the room by scrubbing out the oxygen, uh, which is good. It's, it's less dangerous than changing the actual pressure in the room. Astronauts will go through uh, a hypobaric chamber, uh, which means they'll actually change the pressure into a, a low pressure environment uh, while they're changing the oxygen. Content. What was the guy, don't name names or anything, who had the foam thing that you're saying instead of putting. Oh. The... <laughs> Tell them that. Uh, so, as we're testing hypoxia, we, we want to notice our symptoms of hypoxia. So, we, we the, the biggest thing is people people die from hypoxia because they don't recognize their symptoms and you got to catch yourself in that as you're getting euphoric and before you die you have to figure it out so and grab a mask. and put on oxygen <laughs> and uh <clears throat> they the way they would have it set up is we'd have our oxygen mask on one side and then they do the other side so we'd have four people sitting on this side and four people on that side and then they'd have those four people remove their masks and then they'd be sitting there and then they'd give them little tasks like uh, you know doing uh, dot to dot puzzles or like you know those children's puzzles boxes where you have the square holes and the pegs and and uh, I'm watching these guys that they're like trying to put the triangle peg in the circle hole. just like <coughs> they just couldn't figure it out and then uh, this other guy so the goal was to put your oxygen mask on before you're told or yeah. assisted in putting your own oxygen mask on. And uh, the monitor was going through and this guy just like couldn't, you know, wasn't responding. He was starting to lose it. And so the, the, um, the monitor went over to him and said, okay, put your oxygen mask on. So the guy like reached up and like got the oxygen mask and like put it through his <laughs> Like, what did the it. monitor do? You lost it. You like helped him put oh. it on. He's laughing. I, like, I uh, would if I I couldn't be the monitor of that. I would not. I I just I just it was too fun. Mm -hmm. So you want to explain what Goldilocks is? Uh, so it's not the three little bears. <laughs> but it was named after the three little bears. The Goldilocks zone or habitable zone, you call it. So everything everything that we can observe in this universe has a life cycle including a star and so our sun is our star and our sun uh, is in the early stages of its life cycle um, which means it's a strong and hot star and eventually we know that that star will turn into a red giant and as it turns into a red giant it will grow uh, but the, the Goldilocks zone is basically when a, a planet is close enough to the its sun that it can have liquid water and we call it that because we are our, our definition of a life supporting planet will have liquid water because that's what carbon based life needs to survive is liquid water so there's a certain distance you need to be away from a star to have liquid water so like mars right now is the too hot pluto is the too cold and earth is the just right mm -hmm. but as the goldilocks zone changes mars might be the new just right well actually mars would be we'll mars see. is a little bit further than earth so mars is colder than earth right now so why are we even going there then if it's because not be perfect. as the earth or as the sun expands oh then it'll become it'll get close enough to the sun where it will be, be perfect in the habitable zone yeah, there you go. i actually think mars could have liquid water if it had enough of a uh an atmosphere to protect that water the issue with mars right now is that um the, it does not have a, 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 a magnetic field. Earth has a magnetic field which is very important to protect against radiation. Mars does not have one. Um, does that change with the Goldilocks field? field? No, that has to do with the how fast the, the core of the planet is spinning. And that's um, not going to change when it changes its not position? Not necessarily. So that's one of the biggest issues with living on Mars. But. Uh, we do know that it would be the first place to go when this planet starts getting uh, uninhabitable eaten. or eaten by the sun. Eaten by the sun, because eventually, where our planet is will be engulfed by the red giant sun. So if we do, I mean, this is in millions of years, but we know that there is a timeline. We know that you know we should start venturing out, mm -hmm. and we could first go to Mars, then we could go to the moons of Jupiter then we could you know expand you know as our technology grows will we ever get to Pluto because you know that once mm -hmm. that someone 
um, got rid of it from the planets, the yeah. list. Yeah. What was the name, uh, the, the rhyme? Uh, I know Roy that... G. Biv? No. No. That's the cause. What? <laughs> I was, I was, <laughs> I was going to say on my dear Aunt Sally, but that's the math <laughs> one. What's the one for, plu for the, for the planets? My dear Aunt Sally? No, that's, I thought that was for math. Parentheses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh wow! What's so what so, if they I got rid of if they got rid of Pluto? You can't say the rhyme anymore. Right. Obviously, it doesn't matter because we don't even mm -hmm. know the freaking rhyme. But yeah, they got to keep Pluto because if mm -hmm. the if the Goldilocks thing changes, Pluto would be eventually involved. Yeah, scientists out there, you keep Pluto involved. Well, the reason that they got rid of Pluto is it's so small. It's small. Well, and it has a different orbit. They yeah. changed the definition of what a planet was because they started. Are you defending finding them? Yes. I'm gonna defend Pluto. Yes. Go yes. ahead, fine. Because because they started finding all these right. other rocks that were the similar yeah. size and similar orbits, and it's like, well, if we include Pluto, we're gonna start including all these other ones. Yeah. It's like, okay, let's can't look at the Pluto definition. get um, a grandfathered in? I know, I would like it. And then all the other ones yeah. won't. True. He's grandfathered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's grandfathered. They just didn't like its orbit. You got it. Well, <laughs> they're very picky. Yeah. They didn't like it its orbit. <laughs> Okay. You gotta you gotta conform a little bit there, Pluto. You too much you'd like yourself to be a planet. It's a black sheep. A black sheep. It's grandfather. Well, I like For Pluto, me though. it's yeah. always gonna be Pluto. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. What else That's we got? Good, good planet talk. <laughs> Space talk with Dr. Rock. Whoa! <laughs> Alright. We actually have to do our last last suture um lesson. Do you wanna say anything before we go? Mm -hmm. It's your last No, Mars was awesome. It was fun. Do you yes, recommend um, people coming? Yes. Okay. Come, come to and, um, Check it out. And we are actually going to be adding to the program mm -hmm. flight instructing. So yep. um, zero G flights and all that good stuff. So mm -hmm. just stay tuned for um, more flight Absolutely. with Timmy. Flight with Timmy. we got to come up with a good what, name. Wait, what is your Instagram? Timmy Sky Chaser. I like that one. T yep. Timmy Sky Chaser. At Timmy Sky Chaser. Yeah, well, stay we got to come up with a good one for the flight stuff. But we'll I like the up. Sky Chaser, but yeah. okay, whatever. Yeah, we okay. gotta, and you got to come down. We got to do an interview for the rocket launches and stuff. Cocoa Beach. Uh, that is lift off with Dr. Walk. Use lift the, the, off. Yeah, yeah. I'll put oh, the playlist nice. here, um, and then we'll add to it. Yeah, we'll add perfect. to it. Okay, stay tuned. We're gonna go do our next mission, and then Sims is almost over. So, yep. whoop. Check you next time. See you back on Earth.